Hello everybody, this is Mr. Lima and I welcome you to our series about the way I teach or rather the way that I guide my students through their learning experience and um, we're going to be talking about why I chose to use the flipped classroom design with the mastery system and why is it that I made these changes to the way that I teach so that because I truly believe they are a better way to engage the students in the learning process and to teach in them in a way they've never experienced before. Um, but before I talk about that, uh, before I try to make you understand the logic of this system, I would like to um, review the standard way that teachers teach. You know, um, for hundreds of years, um, the traditional classroom has been this idea of a teacher-centered environment where the teacher is the focus of attention. Attention. He's the one that shares the knowledge, that passes on the information. He's supposed to be the one that knows everything the students need to know. Uh, he's supposed to be the one with all the answers, and even sometimes the one with all the questions. Um, he lectures, he explains the material, he assigns what students need to read, uh, he tells the students what to study, uh, he assigns homework for home so that students can go and go home and practice the things that they've done in class. And then maybe the next time he reviews a little bit of that homework or a little bit of what he talks before, prepares them for the quiz, students gets a quiz, then they gets a test at the end, combining several quizzes. And that for a lot of people, that is the way the classroom works. And growing up, I experienced that. that and I'm sure that many people for many generations will say the same. And a lot of them will say, it worked for me. You know, why change it? You know, here am I. I've learned so much. Um, well, I'd like to challenge you those of you who, are, who have gone through that system, to really think about it. Have you really learned that much that way? Well, a lot of us would say yes, but if, you, if I ask you anything specific that you have learned from a teacher, um, or it would be very hard for you to tell me any specific event that happened during a lecture that you remember. You might remember some of the material, uh, especially if you're prompted uh, with a multiple choice test or a situation that refers back to the material. But most people forget about 90% of what they're taught to a lecture process. And even doing lecture, about only 10% of the people actually learn all the material through lecture. So, and it's actually, if I think back to my days in school, uh, I mean, I guess it depends on the person, but for me, it was when I was doing something, something active, that I really remember what I've learned. And that's why in modern education, we're trying to change this idea of, of the teacher going from a lecture hall where the classes are all lined up next to each other and having this teacher, which is the focus of attention, that imparts the knowledge. It's bigger than the students. He's of the almighty uh, communicator. And then you have homework done at home where the teacher cannot help the students with the practice. And then you have that quiz, that time quiz intensive that everybody has to take at the same time, the same way. Um, pressure to pass and if you don't well you're just not good enough to be integrated with society are you so this paradigm of education has, has dominated the classroom for a long time and for a lot of us is why we learned and for a lot of us uh, we would say that's the way it should be because well I learned it that way we should teach that way and certainly there's a lot that can be learned this way and I'm not taking anything away from that but at the same time I would like to challenge you to think about uh, the trends in education that are uh, they're emerging now and why what are they trying to get at at this trend of education so there have been some variations to the classic uh, teacher method of studying the classroom design but I would like to show you this other uh, picture here to, to demonstrate that even at the higher level of education colleges graduate schools it just gets worse you know a lot of people teach in this scenario where hundreds of people are sitting there listening to someone who's supposed to be the end all uh, things and so you have the setup where the teacher is in a pulpit standing up with a piece of paper or you know teaching to the students uh, that's a classical way of teaching now there are variations to this so I want to add to that and just to say that there is a lot of good things happening with the standard classroom setup all right for example um, we teach and teach strategies that it's good for teachers to circulate to the classroom. So while they're teaching, not to be caught in that island near the board in the classroom, but try to circulate while you're talking. Try to involve the students by asking questions. Try to uh, encourage their input and, and uh, make sure that you give enough time in class to practice a little bit, that you don't just spend the entire class lecturing. Uh, so you, there are some ways you can try to uh, engage the students 
in a in, while doing the, the standard classroom design. You can you can have a more Socratic method of teaching, for example, where you tell the students to read ahead of time, and then when the time comes to the lecture, instead of focusing on delivering the information, you can ask questions in which the students are delivering the information while you're asking these questions. So instead of you just conveying the information, you can ask the question, have the students discover the answer, or even maybe they know the answer, and by telling each other the answers, basically the students are engaged in the process. Um, you can also use different kinds of questioning strategies. Wait time, you know, uh, wait for the students to answer the questions, give them time to answer the questions. If they don't know the answer, guide them to the answer without actually giving the question or out. Uh, have other students correct each other. In other words, don't don't say, oh, are, it, the, yes, you're right. But people are like, kids, what do you think? Is he right? Um, all of these questioning strategies also uh, go in a certain order to make sure that everybody gets a question. Uh, have a spreadsheet to make sure you're writing down things to make sure everybody has being answered a question. And that way, you engage them in the classroom and make sure that all of the students are paying attention and all the students are participating and that they're learning through the Socratic method of questioning. And even if you're not teaching that way, you can still, after your lecture, ask questions that way. So. There's good ways of teaching, even in the standard method of teaching, by asking questions in the right way. And there's plenty of videos out there that will teach you how to do that, right? But the problem, and I mean with this method, is that even if you try to do these things, you usually don't have enough time to do enough quality of these things because there, there's going to be a need to lecture for at least half the class to more if you truly want to convey all the material. Uh, which... Can, a lot of classrooms which have the standard methods still involve things like active learning when the the students are do something active like a lab or an exercise or a presentation or an activity, no matter what kind of subject you're teaching. Uh, cooperative learning where students work together and teach each other, review with each other, they pair and t uh, spend some time teaching and they pair some time reviewing and repeating each other. There's lots of strategies like this and I can go on and on about that and I probably will in a different le video lecture series. but. I wanted to point out that although these active and cooperative learning and questioning strategies can all be integrated into the classroom, it's very hard to do that and still maintain, uh, have enough time to do that and still maintain a rigor where you're actually teaching all the content. So what end, ends up happening is that a lot of educators have to sacrifice content in order to increase the quality of learning. In other words, you lecture less, you, you explore less of the material so that you can spend more time doing the Socratic questioning, doing active learning where, te where the students are actually doing something uh, with the knowledge or practicing the knowledge, doing cooperative learning where the students are working together or are pairing with each other or quizzing each other or, or reviewing with each other and things like that. Um, you can enhance lecturing by dividing the material between the students. Each student covers a piece and then they do a gallery walk and they teach each other. Uh, circulating through through each each group that has focus on one thing but as you circulate through the groups so you have one person in charge of presenting the material and everybody else is circulating so you spend five minutes with the groups each group is reviewing one thing and then five minutes later the groups start rotating but one person stays where they are teaching the other groups and that way everybody goes around and learns all the material even though they only focus on one aspect of it so these are all these little things you can do to do cooperative learning and limited uh, um, active learning you can also differentiate the classroom there's no reason you can't differentiate the classroom if you're doing the standard method you can maybe have a group of students working on on one type of task because they're not as ready as other kind of students are so you can do a pretest to, to set up by level or you can differentiate them by interest and measure their interest also with the pretest and then depending on that you put them in groups doing different things depending on what they're interested in you can also differentiate by level in the sense that maybe this group has to study a little bit first and this group comes here to to uh, have a lecture this group comes here to do some active learning and so you split the classroom in smaller chunks and then everybody's doing something and it allows you as an educator to spend more time with smaller groups because you have one group here doing active learning one group in here doing studying because they're not ready for active, active learning or lecturing and throughout the class the groups will circulate through all three of them and they will end up doing all three parts of it but still you're still going to have to dedicate a chunk of the time to a group that's receiving lecture. And by that, you're still wasting class time with the lecture. Now, that is what I'm trying to get at here. That there are a lot of things that teachers have been doing. They've been doing engaging teaching, 
They have been doing Socratic method teaching. They've been doing questioning strategies, which are really good. Active learning, cooperative learning, differentiated classrooms. All of these things are great. Uh, you also have, for example, a standard math class. The teacher teaches, but then it gives a time in class for teachers to for students to practice with or without supervision. You can do focus groups. All of these things are great, and teachers have been using these things. But the problem is that there's a limit to how much is actually being done in the classroom with those things. All limited because of the, of the fact that there's a lot of time in class that must be dedicated to lecture. And in normal classrooms, and you know, they teach you not to talk for more than 30 minutes because if you do, you lose the attention span of the kids. But then I know how it works out there, and I've done it myself. And a lot of times you end up teaching for an hour nonstop because you don't want to give up the content. You think it's too important. You, you, you want to give a lot of examples. You want to give a lot of clarifications. You want to ask questions. You want to do everything you want to do possibly to have them learn. But what ends up happening is that you spend a lot of time getting to the content and not having enough time to actually work with the content in all these tidbits of strategies. I didn't go into detail on the strategies, but I did mention them. But well, let's think about the real classroom. In a traditional classroom, because of all the lecturing, either you don't have enough time to do those things or you, you are doing those things at the expense of the content because you're teaching less because you want to spend more time doing those things, which are important. You need to do those things. However, if you do those things and don't lecture enough, what do you do? You don't have enough time. So that is where we're at right now. And... Um, there is advancement happening in classrooms. For example, a lot of technology has been used in, in, uh, in the classrooms lately. For example, a lot of uh, professors are now recording their lectures, either to with audio or video, and presenting them later to class. So if you missed the lecture, you can still watch them. Uh, lectures are being telecasted, so people, even people who are not sitting in the classroom can, can listen to the lectures. Um, you also have virtual schools. You have virtual labs and demonstrations. Students take computers to classroom to type notes. Look at this picture of the college classroom here and how many kids are actually having laptops. Or another classroom in the left where laptops are actually imbued in the classroom as part of the classroom design so that t uh, students have access to using the computers during class. Instead of the old paradigm that you see here in the top left of students taking notes, it's being replaced with uh, uh, computers you know, in the classroom. And you see the telecast here on the upper right. You also have things like ebooks, where the kids no longer have actual textbooks, but they use the textbooks either on a laptop or a, a tablet, and so that it facilitates the process. You also have presentations. Remember, back in the day when I used to be a student, there was no such thing as a PowerPoint presentation or a Prezi or anything like that. Nowadays, we have these fancy ways of presenting the material to students and with audio, video, and image interactions which allow the students to participate more you don't have just the projectors or the slide projector or things like that we are diversifying with that you also have the idea of satellite classes where you have a, a classroom here and a classroom there um, all of these things connected to one central classroom where the teacher is teaching so you allow the students from all over the world maybe to learn from one teacher you know, and now you also have things like Google Doc notes where the, the, the teacher posts the notes ahead of time and so the students can come to class already having the notes and they just have to add to their notes. So all of these things are starting to be used by teachers even at the elementary and, and the uh, high school level uh, to advance the lecture part of the class and in terms of making it more relevant. But I still think that all of this hasn't done enough for education. You know, we have... We have all of these tragedies. When you take an education course, you learn about, you know, active learning, cooperative learning, differentiated classroom, involving the parents, uh, uh, using technology, you know, uh, using proper questioning strategies, engaging the classroom in Socratic method teaching, circulating instead of staying, standing still. And I can go on, you know, there's so much that I've learned by, by taking these classes. But the traditional classroom has an inherent problem. The content delivery consumes time, which takes away from the experience. And either you have to sacrifice the content to give more time for experience, or you have to sacrifice the experience to enhance the content. And that is the dilemma that all of us educators have been faced. And we have not have been able to solve it until we came up with the flipped classroom design. I'll talk more about it in Lecture 2, where we're going to be focusing on the inherent problems with the classic method and what's wrong with it.